And we move now to our debate on resilience and recovery, a very important moment for uh, uh, our plenary today. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Paolo Gentiloni, the Commissioner on the Economy, uh, for being here with us today. Uh, dear Commissioner, it is my pleasure to welcome you at our committee's plenary session. We strongly appreciate your relentless efforts for EU's recovery. You can count on our committee and on the local and regional authorities that we represent to support your call of a swift adoption of the EU budget and the next generation EU. You can also count on us to turn the EU plans into concrete projects and results for Europe, for its citizens. Regions, cities, villages all across Europe are united in their efforts to cope with the emergency and prepare the recovery. Our regional and local barometer that uh, I presented yesterday with the presence of uh, President uh, von der Leyen shows that thousands of mayors, governors, and regional presidents are striving every day to guarantee health care services, keep their communities safe, help the weakest, and support local businesses and local economies. We are developing cross-border health services as between Poland and Belarus. We design innovative medical and social services for the elderly, as in Spanish and French regions. We set up expert teams to help employees adapt their business, as in the Dutch city of Zwolle. The EU's effort to launch a recovery and resilience facility can only succeed if we build on their experience, knowledge, and leadership. Regions, cities, towns are in charge for more than a half of public investment in Europe today. If they stop, Europe stops. The pandemic seizures effect with increased costs for public services and falling revenues from taxes and fees is a ticking bomb for all of our local finance. For instance, cancelling the Semana Santa in Sevilla led to a 400 million euro loss for the local economy with devastating effects on the city fiscal income. Foreign tourist cancellations costed the Florence municipality 200 million euros in missing tax income, not to mention Italy and Greece, who have suffered from these tourist cancellations. According to a joint COR-OECD recent poll, the vast majority of Europe's regional and local authorities expect a significant decrease in the revenues also in 2021 and 2022. In Germany, France, and Italy alone, subnational governments and their losses are estimated at over 30 billion euros for 2020. So without a strong EU action, broad territorial differences and diversified support capacities by national governments will exacer exacerbate the existing regional disparities. Our regions, cities, villages need extraordinary financial support now. Let me reassure those who plead for a centralized approach because it seems to be faster and less complex. No one wants to slow down implementation. But our point is that there is no impact without partnership. Multi-level governance is not the problem. On the contrary, 
it is the most effective solution. President von der Leyen yesterday informed us that the Commission has sent this message loud and clear to Member States, asking them to fully involve regions and cities in the recovery. This is really crucial, Commissioner. As we must learn from the past, the European semester, the start phase on the Juncker plan, and to some extent also the structural funds, have all suffered the consequences of a top-down governance. We need to join forces today and avoid that top-down policy-making which undermines the facility's impact. I suggest that we shape together the code of contact to involve regions and cities and improve cooperation among all levels of government, European, national, regional and local. This will help coordinate the unprecedented set of investment tools that will soon be available. Also thanks to your personal valuable work, Commissioner. On the other hand, we must also avoid a competition between different funding tools. We should also work together to better communicate the opportunities stemming from the upcoming EU funds, engaging together with citizens and local actors. So my proposal to you is to jointly organize a recovery and resilience regional forum. This would help us monitor the impact of EU decision on the territory, share experiences of the implementation phase, and of course, provide knowledge to reassess all the investment plans. Finally, we wish to cooperate to design new, smarter debt and deficit rules at national and EU level in order, Commissioner, to ensure public services and investment keep full priority. So, dear Commissioner Gentiloni, thank you again for joining us today. We look forward in a very, very, very interesting discussion and debate, and the floor is yours. Commissioner Gentiloni, the floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you very much, President. I hope you can hear me. Um, yes, we can. Okay. Um, glad to, to participate um, to this plenary in such difficult time. Uh, as you just reminded, and I, uh, I've read in your draft opinion, um, local and regional authorities are responsible uh, for more than half of public investment in the EU. Uh, and for sure now in this um, extraordinary uh, situation, uh, local authorities are at the forefront. Uh, and uh, we, we pay tribute to your commitment, to the, the example um, that you are giving uh, to your citizens um, and to face the, the health care situation, but also the economic consequences of this uh, crisis. So it is clear that this expertise uh, is absolutely crucial for the recovery strategy uh, and that local and regional authorities will uh, be, no doubt be uh, partners in making sure that this uh, recovery strategy is a success. The pandemic has triggered not one, but three crises, a public health crisis, an economic crisis, and a social one. And no country has been spared, 
And of course, we are not talking about numbers in a report. We are not talking about a distant tragedy. Uh, it has impact the whole world and every individual. It has hurt countries, regions, cities, and even the most isolated villages. By now, as you know, nearly 4 million people have been diagnosed with COVID in Europe. Of those, 200,000 have lost their lives. The pandemic has also caused immense human suffering through its economic implications. And as Commissioner for Economy, my task is in particular to look at this economic impact. As you are well aware, COVID has caused a recession of historic proportions. In 2009, the financial crisis uh, contracted the European economy by 4.5%. The latest Eurostat figures show how much worse COVID has already been for Europe. GDP has shrunk by 14% in the second quarter, the biggest drop since the war. And at the end of the year, our forecast is that the contraction will be around 8%, so more or less the double than the one in 2009. Recovery is underway, um, but uh, it has probably uh, been losing momentum uh, since the end of August in the last couple of months. Uh, uh, and it is rather uneven, both among uh, different member states of the Union and among different sectors uh, of uh, the economy. On the same period, uh, employment decreased by 2.9%. So millions of Europeans have lost their jobs. But we know that uh, these figures are not uh, showing the, the, how uh, deep the employment crisis is, because if we look to the drop in hours worked, it is much bigger than this. And of course, the uh, increase of uh, unemployment has, has been faced by several measures taken by the Union by member states, by regions and local authorities. And these measures will be complemented uh, from next months uh, with the sure uh, mechanism that is ready uh, to go. So very deep crisis. The response to this crisis has been um, our absolute priority. Already in March, as you know, we uh, took important decision, the temporary state aid framework, uh, which allowed a member state uh, to, to put on the table uh, three trillions of uh, public uh, guarantees for extraordinary state aid, and the activation of the so-called Genescape Clause of the Stability and Growth Pact that made possible the necessary uh, response uh, from member states. And the response came. We spent, on average, 4.5% uh, of GDP uh, this year in discretionary uh, extraordinary measures and 25% of GDP, on average, on public guarantees uh, to uh, support uh, companies uh, and uh, the economy. Uh, and after temporary uh, uh, scheme for state aid and general escape clause, we decided, as I just said, this sure mechanism, um, 100 billion euros in supporting our short uh, work schemes uh, in all member states. Then this May, we proposed the, the most powerful instrument that is indeed a new chapter in our common history, 
the next generation EU, which empowers the Commission to borrow up to 750 billion in the markets. And these funds will be raised uh, and at a large degree will be repaid through uh, new own resources. As you know, what the heart of this next generation EU is the recovery and the resilience facility, which is more or less 90% of um, uh, next generation EU in grants and loans. Uh, this funding has one important condition. Member states have to uh, propose uh, ambitious recovery and resilience plans. These plans will not be written in Brussels, but the Commission is not a financial intermediary. So we will not limit our role to borrow in the markets and transfer this uh, money to national governments. Uh, we will make sure that national plans are coherent with our common framework, which is not to go back to the previous situation, but to make our economies more sustainable, more resilient, and more competitive. So the Commission will closely assess these national plans. They need to respond to the country-specific recommendation that we delivered in 2019 and 2020 and they need to contribute to the green and digital transition. The political commitment by the leader, as you know, uh, included strict targets at this end, at least 37 percent uh, to contribute to climate goals and 20 percent to make Europe digital. And I'm very happy that the Committee of Regions had proposed a very similar target, 40 percent for the green uh, commitment. Member states will have to commit to specific milestones and targets which have to be achieved before funds flow. As you will be aware, last week the Council finalized its negotiating mandate. And by early November, we hope that the European Parliament too will have the mandate in hand. I very much hope that we will have an agreement on the RRF by the end of the year. Many of your suggestions have also influenced the public debate and found their way into the current text. I was glad to read that your draft opinion is very supportive of the RRF. I understand, however, that you do have a number of other worries. And in particular, let me address a couple of, of these. Uh, your draft opinion forces to reduce the role of the European semester in the process. Well, you know that the semester was established as a response to the financial crisis when the EU clearly lacked a common understanding of the situation and a coordinated approach was sorely missing. And indeed, we need this coordination in a situation where the large majority of member states share the same currency, but not the same uh, budgetary policy. This is the reason why coordination is essential. The semester is certainly far from perfect. On the contrary, as always in European integration, we need to constantly update our tools adapting them to the new global reality. And I think that the response to the COVID crisis will help us in also in updating the semester and our fiscal rules. But already now, the fact that you have integrated the social pillar and started integrated the UN SDG goals into the semester demonstrate exactly the necessary effort to renew our tools, making them always more forward-looking. I know you also call for a closer engagement of local and regional authorities, and I fully agree with you. Recovery and the resilience plan can only be a success if national governments work closely with all the relevant authorities across the country. 
We have therefore strongly insisted that member states ensure a thorough involvement of their parliaments and all stakeholders, including, of course, local and regional authorities. This is clearly written in our guidance and we will insist in the coming months during the dialogue with national governments. Each member state has its own legal framework and tradition to consider, but we do ask member states to report in their plans how they consulted and involved local communities and authorities and to foresee an inclusive implementation. We trust that all governments will ensure this inclusive approach, and we will work together with you to make this possible. Thank you very much, and I'm ready to hear your comments and answer your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Um, I will uh, now give the floor to our colleagues here uh, in the Committee of the Regions, those of uh, you who are uh, in uh, person here and those of you who are uh, connected online. And I will start with Michael Murphy. Michael, you have the floor. Uh, dear Commissioner, uh, dear President uh, Zizi Kassas, dear colleagues, uh, I'm very pleased to take the floor uh, in this very important debate on behalf of the EPP group. Uh, I speak to you from my office here in Tipperary uh, in the southeast of Ireland. The socio-economic fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic, a pandemic that has seen local and regional authorities extremely exposed to onerous expenses and unforeseen investment costs has already been elaborated by both President Sisi Costas and you, Commissioner Gentiloni, whom I thank for your valued presence. We all know that the next generation EU is a major recovery package. Its scale speaks for itself. But for a successful recovery, and so successful next generation EU programs, plans need to be carefully uh, designed. Financial resources in themselves are not enough without a multi-level and partnership approach grounded in cohesion, EU added value and innovation. These cannot remain mere buzzwords. Commissioner, social resilience in layman's terms is about well-being and decent working and level conditions. Europe needs to act and be seen to act, to act locally and to act swiftly. We need to think local and regional. Be it a Swedish company working on water recycling technology for water and energy savings, a Polish milk powder factory or an Irish medical logistics company, the EU's firepower through, for example, InvestEU must couple with SME's innovation and their drive to a long-term green and digital transition and to keep a competitive edge. Commissioner, if we take recovery and resilience facility, we are concerned by how light the language is concerning the involvement of local and regional authorities in shaping and assessing the recovery and resilience plans. The lack of a bottom-up approach in shaping the plans and setting targets and timelines from the get-go needs to be closely looked at. Local and regional authorities are closest to the citizen and a day-to-day -day demonstration of active subsidiarity. Local and regional authorities are, in the main, excellent budget balancers operating within different kinds of legally binding fiscal constraints. For the EPP group, solidarity and responsibility go hand in hand. Looking at the changes to economic governance brought about by the pandemic and But we need to keep a sustainable reform agenda that takes into account sound public finances tuned to a new post-COVID-19 economic reality that integrates the de green, digital and innovation transitions. 
this I'm sure you'll agree, is a real challenge. We want to see projects of EU added value, and we welcome the idea of flagship areas and local and regional authorities must play their part in defining them. To power up, to connect, to modernize, to scale up and to upskill and reskill. In conclusion, Commissioner, the pandemic threatens to undo years of positive results of EU funding and make poor regions poorer and rich regions richer. As President Zizi Costas has made clear in his intervention, there can be no impact without partnership. Dear colleagues, President, Commissioner, I thank you for your attention, look forward to your replies and indeed the rest of the exchanges. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Ms. Pokorna has the floor now, please. Germanova, Pokorna, please. Hello, do you hear me? Hello? Go ahead, yes. Yeah. Vážený pane předsedo, vážený pane eurokomisaři, dámy a pánové kolegové. Ráda bych v reakci na projev pana eurokomisaře pohovořila o situaci v České republice z hlediska Recovery and Resilience Facility a zároveň se podrobněji zaměřila na hospodářskou obnovu po, koronavir po koronavirové krizi ve středočeském kraji, kde jsem poslední čtyři roky hejtmankou. Věřím, že řada otázek a výzev, na které narážíme ve středočeském kraji z hlediska hospodářské obnovy i RRF, jsou platné i v ostatních krajích České republiky. Pokusím se je tedy krátce schrnout. Čerpání RRF v České republice podléhá sestavení tzv. národního plánu obnovy, který je řízen ministerstvem financí a momentálně vzniká jeho první návrh. Za návrh prioritních oblastí jednotlivé akce a odhadované alokace, které jsou jeho součástí, odpovídá Národní ekonomická rada rády, rady vlády, která je složená zejména ze zástupců soukromého sektoru. Bank, komerční banky nebo české spořitelny mobilních operátorů, velkých firm jako je energetická společnost ČES, Škoda nebo i hospodářské komory České republiky, což vede k tomu, že je Národní plán obnovy spíše vytvářen zástupci soukromého sektoru a bude dle odhadu kopírovat i priority soukromých subjektů a nikoli v regionu. Například v oblasti telekomunikace již bylo prezentováno několik velkých projektů od společnosti O2 či SEFIN. Narážíme tedy na problém, kdy jsou členské státy pod velkým tlakem, protože Evropská komise po nich logicky požaduje, aby plány byly propracovány velmi detailně. Musí obsahovat všechny návrhy plánovaných reform a investicí, musí v nich být přesně popsáno, jaké cíle mají být dosaženy a jaký bude jejich dopad a musí se již jednat o vyspělé projekty v poslední fázi příprav. V této souvislosti je soukromý sektor považován za pružnější než regiony a předpokládá se, že může nabídnout rychlejší řešení. Za své projekty proto logicky lobuje. Já se však domnívám, že by měly v České republice zohledněné především priority regionů, neboť mají ze své podstaty širší dopad na veřejnost a přispívají k rozvoji a chodu celé společnosti. I když je často zdlouhavé a složité projekty připravit a prosadit, jejich benefity jsou zásadní. Bylo by proto vhodné s regiony mnohem více konzultovat. I Task Force, zřízený Evropskou komisí k RRF, jasně uvádí, že by členské státy měly zorganizovat hned několik konzultací právě za tím účelem, aby plány a v nich uvedené investice či reformy odpovídaly místním a regionálním potřebám. Ale to se bohužel v České republice dostatečně neděje. Středočeský kraj by se v rámci hospodářské obnovy chtěl zaměřit na digitální transformaci, což je jedna ze šesti prioritních os pro Českou republiku a zároveň bylo na toto téma alokováno 20 všech zdrojů z RRF. Ve středočeském kraji bychom chtěli v rámci obnovy podpořit digitalizaci krajských nemocnic, více zohlednit telemedicínu. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Germanova. Um, I will give the floor to Mr. Dirupo 
there was a mixed up here with the system. Uh, you should have uh, taken the floor earlier. Mr. Dirubo, yes. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Merci, Monsieur le Commissaire, pour votre présence. La Commission a pris la bonne décision en actionnant la clause dérogatoire du pacte de stabilité et de croissance. Et la question que chaque entité territoriale, chaque région, chaque État membre se pose, c'est de savoir combien de temps sera maintenue cette clause dérogatoire. Les virologues et autres épidémiologistes estiment que nous ne serons pas débarrassés de la Covid avant l'été prochain. Et Monsieur le Commissaire, je vous passe la teneur des débats scientifiques contradictoires entre experts médicaux quant à la capacité réelle qu'auront les vaccins à générer des anticorps bloquant le virus. En termes économiques et budgétaires, cela signifie que les budgets des entités locales, des régions et des États membres seront catastrophiques durant plusieurs années que ces budgets ne pourront être tant soit peu stabilisés qu'au mieux en 2022 et plus vraisemblablement en 2023. La clause dérogatoire devra donc être maintenue à tout le moins jusqu'au moment où le virus sera totalement éliminé. La clause dérogatoire devra être maintenue aussi longtemps que les finances publiques ne soient plus dramatiquement impactées à cause de l'épidémie. Au-delà du maintien de la cause dérogatoire, euh, il faut préparer déjà maintenant une réforme en profondeur de la gouvernance économique européenne. Je sais que vous y travaillez. Il ne sera pas possible de revenir au statu quo ante une fois que les vaccins efficaces seront disponibles. Il nous faudra une ambition plus importante que de juste vouloir réparer. La résilience pour les crises futures doit être anticipée. Il faut donc une réforme en profondeur de la gouvernance économique européenne qui inclut une réflexion sur les indicateurs, notamment ceux relatifs au développement durable. Il nous faut aussi une démarche beaucoup plus inclusive pour le semestre européen. Semestre européen qui, au demeurant, pourrait parfaitement changer de nom pour devenir une nouvelle stratégie de coordination économique. Une stratégie qui impliquerait le Parlement européen et les collectivités territoriales. Il nous faut aussi une réforme de la comptabilité des investissements publics. Les normes secs pousse à des mécanismes parfois absurdes. Monsieur le Commissaire, vous le savez, le retour à l'équilibre budgétaire dans de nombreux pays, régions, autorités locales prendra de très nombreuses années. Certains disent au moins deux décennies. Et vous savez aussi qu'un retour à l'austérité replongerait l'économie générale dans d'énormes difficultés. Il nous faudra encore beaucoup d'argent pour assurer les investissements publics nécessaires pour relancer les activités économiques. Beaucoup d'argent pour recréer des emplois correctement rémunérés, réduire la pauvreté. Beaucoup d'argent pour assurer la transition écologique et la transition dans les secteurs clés de la santé, de l'alimentation, des transports, du numérique. Dès lors, mon groupe politique vous adjure de faire preuve d'une toute nouvelle approche des réalités des finances publiques. Les fonds dégagés par l'Union européenne, et vous les avez évoqués, seront bien utiles. Ce qu'il faut éviter, Monsieur le Président et Monsieur le Commissaire, c'est que la Commission ne lie la liquidation des aides financières aux États membres à des réformes dites structurelles du sacré semestre européen. J'en termine. L'heure est grave et vous le savez, Monsieur le Commissaire. Mon groupe veut transformer les énormes difficultés du moment en des opportunités. Des opportunités pour reconstruire une société plus humaine et plus consciente de son environnement. C'est à cette approche que nous invitons la Commission. Connaissant votre sensibilité, Monsieur le Commissaire, je ne doute pas que vous me comprenez et que vous agirez dans ce sens. Et je vous remercie infiniment. Merci beaucoup, Premier ministre. I give the floor now to Mr. Marco Marsilio. 
Buongiorno signor Commissario, buongiorno Presidente, grazie della parola. Intervengo a nome del gruppo ECR, Conservatori e Riformisti. Ho ascoltato il suo intervento, anche se mi sarebbe piaciuto ascoltarlo nella nostra comune lingua madre, vista la traduzione multipla simultanea, non capisco perché abbia scelto diversamente, ma questa è una questione, non è la questione principale che intendiamo affrontare. Le sa che la Commissione economica, sociale e territoriale costituisce uno dei fulcri dell'attuale assetto costituzionale dell'Unione, perché essa trae la propria base giuridica direttamente dal testo dei trattati. I suoi principi informatori non dovrebbero mai essere tralasciati, neppure sul presupposto della necessità di fronteggiare una situazione straordinaria come quella determinata dalla pandemia. A fianco a questa motivazione di carattere formale ve ne è un'altra di tipo sostanziale. Nel corso degli anni la politica regionale ha dato prova di essere uno strumento di investimento strategico anche per il perseguimento di obiettivi generali dell'Unione, poiché assume le regioni e i territori efficacemente al centro dei programmi e degli interventi cui quegli stessi investimenti sono preordinati. Analogamente, se si intende conseguire compiutamente gli obiettivi generali che la Commissione von der Leyen si è assegnata all'indomani della pandemia, non si dovrebbe prescindere dal ruolo che le regioni e i territori possono e debbono esercitare. Ora, sebbene l'implementazione delle decisioni che verranno assunte a livello nazionale debba necessariamente avere una sua dimensione a livello dei singoli territori che noi amministriamo e nei confronti dei cittadini che ci hanno chiamato a rappresentarli, non è ancora chiaro quale sia il ruolo che la Commissione assegna alle regioni e come lo stesso possa e debba essere esercitato. Anzi, a ben vedere, un ruolo esplicito sembra mancare del tutto. Un altro aspetto sul quale non soltanto noi, ma l'opinione pubblica nel suo intero, intero si interroga in queste ore, è se queste risorse arriveranno in tempo per scongiurare che la crisi assuma risvolti ancora più catastrofici di quella che essa ha già. In tal senso, come responsabile per gli affari economici della Commissione europea e dunque principale fautore di quegli obiettivi generali e di portata epocale che ha avuto giustamente modo di rimarcare anche oggi in questa sede, le chiedo, anche tenendo conto del ruolo fondamentale che la Commissione è chiamata a svolgere nel processo istituzionale in corso, per ordinato la formazione del quadro definitivo dei provvedimenti, uno, quale dovrà essere nel fermo proposito e nelle intenzioni della Commissione il margine di manovra delle regioni nei confronti dei governi nazionali per indirizzare l'utilizzo di questi fondi anche tenendo conto degli obiettivi e delle priorità regionali. Due cose intende fare concretamente la Commissione per fare in modo che questo margine di manovra venga rispettato. Tre cose intende fare concretamente la Commissione per accelerare la definizione del quadro provvedimentale propedeutico alla mobilizzazione delle risorse e per ultimo quando arriveranno, signor Commissario, queste risorse. Grazie Marco, Marco. Uh, I give the floor now to Baril Sole. Bernard, you have the floor. Thanks, Mr. President, Mr. Gentiloni. It's clear that the Recovery and Resilience Fund is going to be crucial in the recovery phase to achieve a greener, more digital and cohesive Europe. Regional governments have been in the front line during the COVID-19 crisis and have been managing European funds for a long time, giving them to the most needed sectors. European regions have worked to get together whether we are a part of the same state or cross-border. In the case of Catalonia, projects with cross-border territories take place within the framework of the Euroregion, the Brunis World Community and other entities and initiatives. The Catalan government presented last July the EU Economic Recovery and Social Protection Plan. This plan incorporates the priorities set by the European Commission. First of all, ecological transition, digitalization, strong health and social protection system, and a boost to research. In addition, this plan is aligned with the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda. The large volume of the Recovery and Resilience Fund needs an important role from the European regions. For the reason, we've taken to the European Parliament and the Committee of the Regions the need to involve the regions in the design, implementation and supervision of this fund. Finally, this fund should be made available to the public as soon as possible, raising the prepayment of the funds for next year above the 10% initially planned. The urgency of this exceptional moment requires it. Thank you very much. 
Okay, I will thank you very much. I would like to give now the floor to Uros Brezan from the Greens, please. Thank you, President, dear Commissioner, dear colleagues. Thanks for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Green Group in Committee of Regions on this extremely significant issue of resilience and recovery facility. It is of vital importance that EU found wisdom and common ground to establish this 750 billion euros worth next generation EU that has a true potential. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have a list of uh, uh, colleagues who want to uh, take the floor. Uh, I will give the floor now to our colleagues for 30 seconds each, because in uh, 12 minutes, uh, Commissioner Gentiloni will take the floor to, to answer, to react, because then he will have to leave us. So. Gaetano Armao, 30 seconds, please. Grazie. Grazie molte. Il Recovery Resilience Facility deve contemplare adeguatamente il tema della condizione di insularità, che purtroppo è assolutamente marginale, non è stato riconosciuto nelle misure sino adesso adottate dagli Stati membri, che hanno gravato le regioni di oneri che non hanno uguali, soprattutto nel nostro Paese, rispetto ad altri Paesi dove invece lo Stato ha fatto di più eh, per sostenere le regioni. E poi il tema del, dei divari. L'ha detto il Presidente Sessi Costa, se è il momento di scongiurare attraverso una gestione multilivello che i divari si aggravino. Per far questo è necessario intervenire con misure che coinvolgano le regioni e gli enti locali, a partire dal superamento del divario digitale e a partire dagli interventi per la condizione di insularità, che in Italia vuol dire a mio avviso l'intervento sul ponte di Messina che incredibilmente ancora oggi non è inserito nel eh, recovery plan nazionale che invece è pronto per essere realizzato. Grazie. Grazie mille. Vincenzo Bianco, 30 seconds. Un saluto affettuoso e un ringraziamento a Paolo Gentiloni eh, dal profondo sud dell'Europa da Catania. Una domanda telegrafica, visto i 30 secondi. Eh, egli ricorderà, perché era amministratore apprezzato del Comune di Roma, che c'è stato un periodo in cui l'Unione Europea ha dato risorse direttamente ai comuni. Ricordo i progetti Urban e i PON Metro. Io sono terrorizzato dalla burocrazia e dai vari passaggi. Per accelerare la spesa è possibile dare risorse direttamente agli enti locali per progetti di livello e di qualità? E infine, si può immaginare che il Comitato delle Regioni sui sette punti sia consultato in modo anche informale per ascoltare la voce delle Regioni e delle città? Grazie ancora Presidente Gentiloni e buon lavoro. Grazie mille. Dietmar Brokes, please. For 30 seconds. Ja, vielen... Vielen Dank, Herr Präsident. Sehr geehrter Herr Kommissar Gentiloni, meine lieben Kolleginnen und Kollegen, die Aufbau- und Resilienzfazilität, das Herzstück des EU-Aufbauinstruments, wird auch in den Regionen Europas zugutekommen müssen. Wie anderswo in der EU wird auch meine Heimatregion Nordrhein-Westfalen ihr politisches Gewicht einsetzen, um den Ausgestaltung möglichst zukunftsorientierter Aufbaupläne mitzuwirken. Denn, im, denn die Rahmenbedingungen sind von Region zu Region unterschiedlich. Daher brauchen wir regional abgestimmte Investitionspläne. Meine Damen und Herren, für uns alle muss aber auch gelten, die Rechtsstaatlichkeit, das Fundament des europäischen Wiederaufbaus und der Dankeschön. Investitionspolitik auch auf Basis der europäischen Semester. Die Wahrung der Rechtsstaatlichkeit ist Grundvoraussetzung für einen modernen EU-Haushalt und starken Wiederaufbaufonds. Dankeschön. Wir fordern daher den Rat auf, entsprechend effektive rechtsstaatliche äh, äh, Mechanismen einzusetzen. Vielen Danke. Dank. Joseph Frey, please.
Herr Kommissar, es ist uns wichtig, dass der Prozess zu und in Ihrem Maßnahmenpaket mit größter Transparenz zu allen Beteiligten im Rahmen des Multilevel Governance erfolgt. Dabei sind auch die Sozialpartner und die Zivilgesellschaft einzubeziehen, um größtmögliche Identifikation und Wirkung des Maßnahmenbündels zu erzielen. Es steht für uns aus der Grünen Fraktion im ADR außer Frage, dass den Investitionen für Klimaschutz und die Bewahrung unserer Lebensgrundlage höchste Priorität eingeräumt werden muss. Ich danke Ihnen schon jetzt dafür, dass Sie sich in diesem Sinne für unsere europäische Solidargemeinschaft einsetzen. Dankeschön. Ms. Sakadeus, please. Brigitta, 30 seconds. Health is wealth, and um, 20 out of the 27 uh, countries do have the responsibility, the region and the local level do have their responsibilities for, for health care. So, of course, the regions and local uh, authorities are very important. And this pandemic showed how important it is to have a well-equipped and robust uh health care system and also uh, we that we also work with um public health because that is the competence of the eu and we have already some uh, organizations in, within the eu that look for uh, public health like ecdc and in the future i think it's will be very important to still work with public health. Thank you. And that's why it's an idea to have um, um, hospitals that are have a minimum of, of the level Thank of uh, quality. Thank you. Thank you. Yonik Pollet, please, 30 seconds. Okay, Lozano Mart Martinez Lozano, please, for 30 seconds. Muchas gracias, Presidente, señor Comisario. No solo la región de Murcia, la que os represento, sino que todas las regiones y ciudades necesitamos sentir que la Unión Europea no deja a nadie atrás. Y para ello es fundamental que el mecanismo de recuperación tenga en cuenta la dimensión territorial de la crisis, tanto en la evaluación de su impacto como en sus propuestas de solución. Así, la implicación de los gobiernos regionales en la preparación de los planes nacionales es clave. En primer lugar, para ayudar a centrar las prioridades, pero también porque tenemos la obligación de gestionar y ejecutar las inversiones europeas de la manera más eficaz posible, para que las reformas e inversiones lleguen cuanto antes a la economía real de nuestras regiones y ciudades. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Alberto Sirio, por 30 segundos, por favor. Tobias Gotthard for 30 seconds, please. Franz Schausberger, please, for 30 seconds. Ja, sehr geehrter Herr Präsident, Herr Kommissar, ich glaube, im Wesentlichen geht es jetzt darum, dass die bestehenden Ungleichheiten zwischen den europäischen Regionen durch Corona nicht noch verschärft werden. Äh, dazu müssen wir in den Regionen und Kommunen auch nachhaltige, innovative und visionäre Projekte ausarbeiten, äh, wenn möglich auch grenzüberschreitend. Auch das scheint mir wichtig. Ausbau der Digitalisierung in den ländlichen Regionen. Ähm, Ausbau des Gesundheitswesens und der dazu unterstützende Maßnahmen, 
das Überleben der Klein- und Mittelbetriebe zu sichern und vor allem auch Kultur zu ermöglichen. Das dürfen wir nicht vergessen, was wir in Salzburg auch besonders tun. Dabei scheint es mir ganz wichtig zu sein, dass seitens der Europäischen Kommission die damit verbundene Bürokratie bei der Zuerkennung dieser Mittel möglichst gering gehalten wird. Danke schön. Um, I would like to give the floor to Fernandez Viana for 30 seconds, please. Angular Vasquez for 30 seconds, please. Hello, uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, uh, Commissioner, uh, and the in Spanish. Es muy importante que la Unión Europea tenga en cuenta que sectores tan importantes como la automoción representan un porcentaje muy importante de la economía europea y del empleo europeo. Han sufrido mucho durante la crisis del COVID y también con el Brexit. Y ahora tienen que tener una prioridad en los planes de recuperación y resiliencia para fortalecer nuestra industria y nuestro empleo. Muchas gracias y tengas en cuenta este sector. Gracias. Gracias. Sergio Cacci, for 30 seconds, please. Sí, Presidente, señor Comisario eh, Gentiloni, eh, gracias. En 30 segundos no se riesce a sintetizar. Imagino el Comisario que recibe esta sassaiola de ideas y de intuizioni dei miei colleghi in soli 30 secondi. Allora chiedo a lui che si trasformi in politica di relazione, cioè si trasformi in commissario di relazione politica nei confronti dei governi dell'Unione Europea, soprattutto del governo che rappresenta meglio sono in Italia e la sensazione che hanno gli enti locali e le amministrazioni locali è quella di venire incontro alle falle eh, dei governi nazionali, cioè non c'è stato un intervento dei comuni e delle regioni eh, su delle eh, su delle esigenze eh, realistiche, ma ci sono stati interventi su falle dei governi nazionali. Questo non ce lo possiamo eh, più permettere, assolutamente. Quindi la politica di relazione è invitare i governi a non eh, cadere nel eh, meccanismo di cosa fare assolutamente con questo recovery fund, perché chiedere il MES o meno, ma Grazie. insistere nel chiedere il MES, insistere nel prendere i eh, soldi del recovery fund e di fare progetti che vengono incontro alle esigenze locali. Grazie. Grazie. Piero Mauro Zanin, please, for 30 seconds. Ah, bisogna mettere la camera. Eh, eh, buongiorno, buongiorno Presidente, buongiorno a Paolo Gentiloni, sono Presidente del Consiglio regionale del Firenze e Giulia. Due eh, sollecitazioni al Presidente Gentiloni. La prima, perché ci sia un reale coinvolgimento eh, delle autonomie locali e delle regioni, bisogna che negli strumenti finanziari di aiuto per superare la pandemia sia previsto un vincolo obbligatorio per cui gli Stati membri coinvolgano gli enti locali, altrimenti questo non avverrà. Secondo, bisogna che questi strumenti che mettete in campo siano veloci, arrivino il prima possibile alle famiglie, alle imprese, alle comunità locali, perché altrimenti eh, rischieranno di arrivare quando già la crisi è conclamata. Per fare questo bisogna intervenire, caro Presidente Gentiloni, con forza sulla euroburocrazia. Bisogna trovare sistemi di ve velocizzazione dell'utilizzo delle risorse per i progetti che vorremmo implementare sulle nostre comunità e nei nostri territori. Grazie Presidente. Grazie mille. Frank Proust, please, our last speaker for today, 30 seconds, Frank. Oui, Monsieur le Commissaire, trois points rapides. Effectivement, je pense qu'il est important que les plans de cohérence, les plans de relance soient faits avec une cohésion européenne pour définir quatre à cinq piliers, car il y a un véritable savoir-faire en Europe. Si nous ne le faisons pas, c'est des pans entiers de notre industrie qui risquent de disparaître. Je rejoins l'interlocuteur sur le deuxième point important, c'est la rapidité. Il ne faut pas faire attention à ne pas intégrer trop de contraintes administratives qui feraient que le plan de relance ne serait opérationnel que dans un an ou deux. 
Troisième point, il faut renforcer la compétitivité de nos industries. Je ne veux pas parler de protectionnisme, mais c'est simplement permettre à l'ensemble de nos entreprises de pouvoir se battre avec les mêmes règles que les autres, parce que sinon, eh bien, on ne pourra pas être concurrentiel sur ce secteur. Cohérence, rapidité et un renforcement de notre production. Quelles sont les trois conditions que la relance soit une relance durable Merci beaucoup, Franck. Uh, I would like now to give the floor to Prime Minister Gentiloni to uh, make his final remarks uh, and uh, react to what uh, our members uh, have said during this debate. Commissioner. Uh, well, thank you very much, President. Uh, thank you all for for your uh, comments and, and questions. Um, of course, the, the uh, most, um, the, the big part of the interventions, uh, beginning from uh, Michael Murphy, the, the, the first intervention, uh, were um, about the uh, relation between national governments and local uh, authorities in this um, recovery and resilience plans. Um, uh, what, what I think is that um, what the Commission um, uh, can guarantee is, uh, one, the framework, uh, and two, uh, the process. Um, the framework means that in our uh, uh, guidance, uh, it is very uh, clear the request to uh, national governments to uh, involve uh, local um, communities and local authorities in designing their plans, uh, thinking locally, as Murphy was uh, saying. Uh, and this um, uh, issue has uh, specificities, um, um, as uh, Armao was saying, the, the, the insularity, um, there is the, the several other interventions, uh, including uh, 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 Zanin, uh, Kachi, and others who are stressing this. So we have uh, the framework that is asking, demanding national government this, and then we have the process. And the process means that we will um, ensure in the dialogue with uh, national government proposals that this happened. We are uh, completely open to uh, participate directly. Uh, the president was proposing um, uh, initiatives like forum at regional level, and we are ready to participate. Um, uh, of course, we uh, unfortunately, we are in times where traveling is not at all uh, easy, but uh, uh, hopefully this time will change. But we are ready to, to participate to this fora. And we are consulting um, uh, already, and so Bianco was asking, uh, with uh, regions, uh, mayors, uh, I have several meetings with uh, uh, mayors and, and regions uh, discussing these uh, plans. Uh, so, of course, we have to take um, the premise, which is uh, we are raising, we are borrowing money and uh, sending money to national uh, governments because the situation of different member states is so different that uh, even trying a differentiated approach would have been impossible for this facility uh, because, of course, we have other uh, forms of, uh, of uh, structural, um, of cohesion uh, and social funds, uh, apart the regional fund, um, and the invest EU activity that are open to local uh, authorities and communities. But for this facility, uh, I think, the, the commitment we can take is on the framework and on the process. We will follow this together with the Committee of the Region to guarantee that what is asked 
in the framework is confirmed uh, in the uh, process of decision making. Uh, Pokorna um, was asking about uh, a, an excessive uh, amount of details in what we ask, and for sure our guidance are uh, pretty detailed, but you know this is uh, quite normal for European funds. I, I could even say that our guidances for the uh, recovery and resilience plans are less detailed than uh, some uh, other traditional uh, structural or cohesion uh, funds guidances. Uh, why we have many details? We have many details because we are managing common money and we want to be uh, as sure as possible that this money is spent in the right way and for common goals. Uh, then Elio Di Rupo was uh, uh, raising uh, a few very important issues. Uh, one, how long uh, will the general escape close last? Uh, as you know, we triggered the close in March. Uh, it was the first time in the European Union experience. Uh, we don't have precedents, but we have, uh, I think, two things. One uh, is what is written in our rules, and it is written that you trigger the general escape clause in case of severe economic downturn affecting uh, the Union. Uh, so uh, we will untrigger this clause when uh, this severe economic downturn will be uh, over. Of course, this means in the Union as a whole, not in every single country or region, because we know uh, that we will have differences. When will this happen? Very difficult now to forecast. So we limited ourselves to make clear to governments that in 2021, the general escape clause will remain in place. And then I think when we will have a less degree of uncertainty, we can discuss on the timing. For now, we know that it will remain in place next year and that uh, we will um, discuss the situation next year according to the evolution and with this premise of the severe economic uh, downturn uh, as a basis. Um, Indeed, uh, as Dirupo was saying, we will uh, discuss also how uh, this extraordinary situation uh, is affecting the discussion that was already uh, going on since February on our economic governance, because the review of the rules of the Stability and Growth Pact was launched by the Commission before the pandemic. But of course, we will uh, bring this uh, discussion on uh, taking in account what happened in these months and with the goal to make these rules simpler, uh, less uh, pro-cyclical and more favorable to public uh, investments. Um, I, I, uh, I will uh, switch to Italian uh, to, to, to answer to um, President Marsilio, um, uh, che uh, il Presidente Marsilio uh, chiedeva um, dell'importanza della dimensione regionale, ma credo di aver già risposto quello che la Commissione è in grado di fare, eh, sia nella cornice che nel processo di attuazione di, questo, eh, di questi piani di recovery. Per quanto riguarda la tempistica, la tempistica, eh, diciamo, formalmente, come sapete, prevede l'approvazione entro il mese di aprile dei piani di eh, recovery and resilience e all'atto dell'approvazione eh, prevede il primo eh, versamento del eh, 10% eh, della, ehm, della cifra eh, totale 
eh, prevista. E, mh, eh, l'onorevole Solè eh, si domandava se questo 10% potesse essere aumentato. Eh, 10% era la proposta della Commissione, a un certo punto il Consiglio lo aveva in realtà eh, diminuito a circa il 7%, sono lieto che nell'ultima fase dei negoziati siamo tornati al 10% e penso che sia eh, all'atto dell'approvazione una cifra ragionevole. Se tutti lavoriamo al massimo, intendo dire la Commissione, il Consiglio, il Parlamento europeo, i parlamenti nazionali, penso che questa tempistica sarà eh, rispettata e questo credo per i normali tempi di reazioni alle nostre crisi eh, significa aver reagito in tempi assolutamente accettabili. Ricordo che la reazione alla crisi finanziaria iniziò dopo quattro anni purtroppo dell'impatto di quella crisi, ma non è una buona ragione per ritardare eh, adesso. E, ehm, credo di aver risposto a, a, a Enzo Bianco per concludere con, con l'italiano sul fatto che abbiamo strumenti per dare soldi diretti alle autorità locali ma abbiamo considerato che questo strumento così eccezionale da es, da, e da vararsi in tempi così stretti eh, doveva avere come interlocutori i governi eh, nazionali. Um, finally, a, a few... Um, Uh, more uh, questions for uh, uh, other members of the committee. Uh, the Honorable Brockes was asking about the, the rule of law discussion. It's a very um, long and complicated discussion. The only point that I want to make is that apparently uh, yesterday we had a uh, not negative Uh, start of the uh, trialogue on this issue. Um, um, so I, I saw that remarks coming from the Parliament and the Council uh, were, uh, of course, not conclusive, but uh, not negative. And so I hope that this pillar uh, of our building can be uh, kept strong and this uh, will not create Uh, hurdles to the recovery process. Um, I fully agree on the importance of health care that was stressed by Honorable uh, Sacredeus uh, and um, on the need um, that Honorable Vasquez was stressing to support especially uh, sectors more uh, affected uh, because indeed um, recovery is underway but Manufacture is uh, going faster, services are slower, and among services we have some sectors that are very strongly uh, still in uh, enormous um, difficulty. Uh, so we need, as Honorable Proust was saying, uh, speed and uh, consistency. And final, final point, as was stressed by Honorable Frey, uh, the uh, importance of the climate transition. This is uh, a sort of uh, um, identity issue for the Commission. Uh, I can summarize it with three figures. One is 55. As you know, we uh, um, strengthened our targets for 2030 from Uh, reduction of 40% to reduction of 55% of emissions. Second uh, number is 37, which is um, near to what the, your committee was suggesting, the threshold of investment connected to the green transition that we ask in the recovery plans. And final uh, number is 30, uh, 30% of the borrowing of these 750 billion euros will be issued in green bonds. And this will make the Commission probably the main global issuer of uh, green bonds. Uh, this is indeed for us a big priority. Thank you very much.
Mr. President, and thank you all. Thank you, Commissioner Gentiloni, for this very interesting discussion that we had today in our second day of uh, this plenary. Um, I think that uh, our members, both the ones who are present here and the ones who are uh, contributing online, and uh, also the people who are following our plenaries and our discussions these days, uh, would have, find, uh, have found this uh, discussion very interesting. So thank you very much again for addressing all these issues. And uh, I should, I wanted to tell you, Prime Minister, that uh, we are really reassured that in these turbulent times, uh, the economy of the European Union uh, falls on your hands, on your stable and experienced hands. Thank you very much again. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, we, I would like also to thank our interpreters who have been here uh, all the time, uh, uh, delivering for us, even if we exceed sometimes the, the time limits. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen of the interpreter services, uh, the translation services. And uh, we will now uh, have a break, and we will reconvene at 2.30 exactly, Brussels time, for our very important debate with Chancellor Angela Merkel. Thank you very much. See you in one hour and ten minutes.